Good morning. Good afternoon. My original plan was to come out and demonstrate my drumming, but the other guys were so much better that I decided I would have to find another subject. A very wise Frenchman once said that every man or woman has the philosophy of their insomnia. And what he meant by that is that each of us tries to reflect, or does reflect, in the abstract ideas we pursue in the afternoon, the fears that haunt us in the middle of the night. If we're frightened of mortality, we might invent a doctrine of an afterlife. We fear the universe is shrinking. We imagine multiverses. My own particular kind of insomnia comes from my brooding always on the, precarious, the precariousness of cosmopolitan civilization. Why is it that again and again throughout human history, and particularly throughout modern history, do we see that societies that seem to us largely peaceful and prosperous, that somehow have solved some of the basic equations of pluralism, that have found practices of cosmopolitanism, principles of pluralism, nonetheless turn out to be wildly insecure, turn out to be prey to sudden overturnings and to sudden capitulations. We need only think of 1914, whose centenary we celebrated recently, or even more sadly, of the events of the last 10 or 15 years to see how real the agony of my insomnia can be. The question really is, what uh, are the principles that underlie those kinds of societies? Eight years ago, at a moment when Barack Obama was about to become president of the United States, I put myself to the work of trying to understand two great liberal thinkers and actors whose 200th anniversary we were about to celebrate. They were Charles Darwin and Abraham Lincoln. And I wrote a book about the strange coincidence that they were born on exactly the same day in 1809 and about what we could learn from their lives and practices about the underlying principles of that thing we call liberalism. Liberalism not in the sense of uh, blind belief in a free market economy, but liberalism in the sense of exactly the underlying foundational beliefs of those kinds of modern democratic cosmopolitan civilizations. Well, eight years later, the philosophy of my insomnia has never been more pregnant, nor perhaps more poignant. We have never been more aware than we have been made in the past year and indeed in the past week of that precariousness. So what were the underlying principles that I was able or struggled to distill from my study of those great thinkers? First, it seems to me, and simplest, liberalism, liberal humanism, rests on two basic and simple pillars. It rests on a belief in reform, and it rests on a belief in reason. Our belief in reform is the counter that we give again and again to those on the extreme left who believe in revolution, who believe that only revolution can remake society in a more equitable form. And we point in the tradition of Darwin and Lincoln to the possibilities of gradual evolution, to the enormous creative possibilities of evolutionary change, of self-organizing change, whether we see it in the biological world or we choose to see it in the political world. We point out that reform, far from being impotent or unable to change societies in fundamental ways, has an extraordinary record of enfranchisement, of adding sovereignty. We point to the extraordinary adventure of the emancipation of women in liberal societies over the past hundred years, something achieved by action, something achieved by self-organization, something achieved by the will of millions of women willing it, but something achieved not through violence, but through the gradual persuasion of whole societies. We believe in reform. We believe in the revolutionary possibilities of reform. And underlying that, we believe as well, I think, in reason. We believe in the great enlightenment tradition, which tells us that reason is powerful, that pointing to evidence can be omnipotent, that actually looking at the problems of society or the problems of humankind, not 
as things that were solved long ago and can only be repeated, but instead as equations that need to be resolved anew in each generation and that can only be resolved anew by looking at the particular evidence that we can find about the nature of human organization and the possibilities of human progress. We look to evidence about how best to organize our healthcare system. We look to evidence about how best to resolve disputes between nations. We look to evidence about the right way to find a balance between the extraordinary engine of prosperity that a free market can be and the absolute need that we have to govern that engine to keep it from overheating and exploding and causing undue and unnecessary suffering. Reason and reform, those are the two foundational beliefs of the liberal dispensation. But they in themselves, it seems to me, in turn, are only expressions of a deeper belief that we inherit from the Enlightenment, and that is the simple belief that we can make our meanings. Men and women can make their own meanings. Meaning in life is not something we simply inherit, nor is it something that we mystically intuit. It's something that we make and that we choose to make, and that the great adventure we call social existence is an adventure in the common making of shared meanings. That's why the central conceptions of liberalism are all about private life as much as they are about public action. When we think of the great thinkers and makers of the Enlightenment, we don't think simply of men and women who took to the streets or to Parliament to make their world. No, we think of people who carved out a new kind of private space from often resistant terrains of tyranny. We think as much of the men and women who began the great adventure of the cafe in 18th century Europe, who began the business of carving out exactly that kind of semi-public, semi-private world in the cafe, and all of our historical evidence tells us that it was in those small associations, it was in the construction of civic capital, it was in the beginnings of social life shared among strangers that the real advances, the real inventions of the liberal imagination began. We believe in that act of making meanings for ourselves and for our friends in a way that perpetually goes forward, propels itself forward to become a form of social change. But let me not be fatuously optimistic. How could one be fatuously optimistic at a moment in history like this one? 25 years ago, those values, the values of liberal humanism, seemed to be disseminated across the globe. They seem to be in the ascendant. They seem to be things that more and more were going to be shared in common by all. And yet we find now that they have never been more threatened. In Eastern Europe, overthrown by autocracies. In Old Western Europe, uh, feeble and being trembling in the face of new indigenous autocracies and fear. We see Brexit accomplished, we see startling consequences in an American election, and we ask ourselves, where have we gone wrong? What is it in that liberal vision, so richly rooted in reason and reform, in the power of the individual and the small group to make new meanings, where has it failed? Where has it gone wrong? And it seems to me that we've failed in the face of the two implacable eyes of our existence. First, the eye of inequality and the truth that no society, no matter how broadly prosperous, can hope to sustain itself if it, if it carries within it the poison of inequality, which produces implacably the problem of social unease, the sense of injustice, which no society can carry forward. But even more than by the eye of uh, inequality, we are threatened and we are brought down by that other eye of identity. For the one thing that liberalism has failed again and again to be able to solve is that larger sense of cosmic meaning that human beings seem to need in their very selves and souls. We fail to provide 
a satisfying sense of identity. And those who come forward in however shoddy or bogus a manner to offer people a comforting politics of identity seem to be able to cut through liberalism like a pathogen passing through a vulnerable human being. Liberalism does many things brilliantly well. It creates sciences, it builds prosperity, it creates private life, but it seems hugely vulnerable when it comes to providing people with a secure sense of common identity. We are vulnerable always to identity politics. Now, if I were a politician, I would tell you that this is the great challenge of the 21st century, to try and find some way to combine those liberal politics of reason and reform, of self-made meanings, with a more secure and available sense of identity, to find some way to translate the enduring values of liberalism into a language of common identity that can be spoken and shared by frightened multitudes. I would say that if I were a politician. Unfortunately, I don't believe it to be true. I think the deeper truth, the harder truth, in some ways the more painful truth that we face in the 21st century, is that we will see again and again what we are seeing today. That is, successive waves and contradictions and cycles. Moments when the attraction of those liberal values of reason and reform and the great liberal humanist record of prosperity and shared progress will attract us and move us forward. And just as potently, moments of reaction and recoil when the need for shared cosmic meanings, when the emptiness, seeming emptiness of liberalism, that emptiness all too well evidenced on the front of the Euro note if, as it spreads through Europe, where there are imaginary bridges that show no place and show no one. That seeming human emptiness of liberalism will always create that recoil. All we can do as people who believe in as this conference demonstrates, who believe in the power of cosmopolitanism, who believe in the open society, who believe in creativity among very different kinds, who believe in multilingualism, who believe in immigration, who believe in uh, the melange of human beings that come together to make a conference like this one or the best of the world we've inherited since the Second World War, all we can do is to try again and again to insist that our values are not merely material, but that they engage us in one of the great human adventures that has happened since the beginning of time. And that is simply to make the world in each generation a little bit better place where happiness is a little more widespread. Thank you very much.